Um, but I want to share with you, you're not, you're not going to hear the testimonies today, but from that service, because we prayed at the end, we had an altar call, and the altar call was about recovering all. Remember that, about recover all. Because when David came through Ziklag, uh, he inquired of the Lord, and the Lord says to him, he says, go and recover all. Well, you know what, from that service, we had a powerful altar call right here, and I remember praying for two people, two individuals. And I remember that day that some, some, some quite big things in their life were taking place that coming week. Now, I'm not going to, I'm not going to share them, but I want to just encourage you this afternoon that testimonies from that week of recovering all was that God opened doors and God recovered all. And the things that they thought were hopeless, God opened the door and they have access to things that they thought that they were not going to get access to. And so I'm saying that to encourage you that when we preach the word, when we believe the word, when we speak the word, we believe that it's truth. We believe that it's active. We believe that when you receive it by faith, that all things are possible. And so I know that we're going to hear these testimonies. I don't want to put anybody on blast today because I haven't prepared you guys. You know, usually I just put you on blast, but... But this week we've got testimony already lined up. But I, I'm saying that to encourage you guys that God is moving. God is answering prayers. God is recovering. God is restoring. And this month uh, in the UK, it's recovery month. And uh, you know, if you know my story, I came from a, a lifestyle of recovery as well. God rescued me from heroin addiction and, and crazy places and rescued my life and set my foot upon a solid ground. Amen. And so recovery is very close to the heart of this church. I mean, you're going to hear a little bit later about that, a, bit, a little bit more about that, but recovery is very close to our heart. I know that many of you in this church and watching online as well, that recovery, whether it was you in recovery or whether it's a family member in recovery, that recovery has been close to you. Amen. Recovery has touched your life at some point. And so let's put our hands together for Sharon as she comes up to share, to share the testimony this afternoon about how God has done great things in our life. Let me just make sure this is switched on for you. I know you probably don't need it, but you know. Uh, uh, voice like us, eh? Uh, I like going for this voice. Yeah? Hi, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, my name is Sean. And uh, just in case anybody doesn't really understand what I'm saying, it was a Pastor Mark you say that uh, it's all right, everything's up in subtitles later on. <laughs> or, or Gary's going to put it on the board for you. Uh, but uh, I'm from Dundee. That's how I uh, speak about funny. It's Pastor Mark likes to joke and that's too funny. But uh, I was brought up in Dundee uh, with two, two other brothers and my sister. But when I was 15, I'm just obviously seeing a wee bit of like my brother and sister. I'm just a wee bit about my family there. Just to give you a just that uh, there's not just me and my family that I've got other siblings as well. But my mum and my dad, uh, my dad was a motor mechanic, but he used to like to go and drink a lot, so uh, he was an alcoholic when I was growing up. But some of the time I didn't see him, he was going back and forward. Uh, but my mum was a good mum, she, she worked all the time and she would always come in, take care of us. But even growing up, I was left to meeting devices sort of thing and I remember I used to I used to hear Monday book. And <laughs> I used to hear Monday book and get it to go to school me and cash it on the way back and we should give me it but uh, to get stuff and but I remember as well like, I'd go home because she would work shifts and uh, obviously my dad was new, he was a motor mechanic so he was he was out a lot like that. But even growing up I was with my dad a lot till I got to a certain age at school and that. So I did hear a bond with my dad. It's not that I've never had a bond with my dad, because I did. Uh, but as 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 I say, as I got all, I used to go to me, but yeah, that that was gone. But uh, so what I was going to say is just to let you know that when I used to go, he'd be scared. I remember I used to kind of out houses you got, and I used to chat the windy. Kids so would pop up so we could get in. I remember we'd come here for school. I come here for what she say. What's the matter? I just broke my unit. And that was the mood. Uh, so I just thought it would be joking that in there too. But when I was 15, that was it for me. Like, uh, I started to go a bit of control. I was going to discos, I was getting in discos and that at 15. I started like tatting amphetamines and then uh, I smoked harsh, but I didn't really like it. But when I was 17, that was when I first experienced the jail and it was a remand. But I remember it didn't, it didn't scare us. I wouldn't say it scared us to an extent. Because it's like that, it sort of toughened you up. But when I got out, I was going to meet this guy, he was four years older than me. 
Well, uh, we decided to, to settle down, so to speak. And so when I was uh, 20, I had my son. But in between that, uh, I was obviously I was settling down, I was a mum, but he was still out of the bookies a lot, and he was very well known around your area. Uh, so when uh, his mum and dad died, the two of them died. And I think obviously there's always turning points when you get deeper and deeper. And that was one of the turning points, his mum and dad died. And I was quite close with his mum and that. And so when, when they died, that, that was horrific for him. And like that obviously went out to us and to the family. He wasn't a violent man or that, he was really a good guy. And, uh, but obviously he didn't know how to express anything. And so that was where the hydrocodine came in. And so like his mates and that, and he would tap them obviously numbing things and then I would tap them to try and numb things. Uh, but it, my son was two and I just wanted to tap care of my son, but I thought I need to, get, I need to stop talking them, but the day I tried to stop talking them, I couldn't. I, I started to withdraw. I didn't know it was withdrawals at the time, but people would say it to us, but they weren't of that well known, but people would say, you can like, oh, watch when you come off and now I can be fine. And so, but I didn't, and I started to rattle and, and I was like, I need to do something about this. And somebody said to me, why don't you go try and get put on meth? It's like, we've got methadone. I was like, what's methadone? And so, they were like, oh, well, you get that out of your own painkillers and things like that. So, I went to the doctor anyway, and I told the doctor I'd been tapping the hydrocodone, and he said to me, I'll well, give you 30 mil, me unless you could either take it or leave it. That maybe wasn't exact words, but that was me unless he was saying, I'll give you 30 mil, like, that, that, that should be it, like, you could either take it or you didn't take it. So, what was meant to do? I took it. And, uh, but it did stabilise me for a lot of years. But obviously as well, I was still going out at the weekends and things like that. And, but as, as it went on, like with the methadone and then me and him separated when I was 30. And so that was me, my life just spiraled back out of control again. And I, don't, I never took smack before in my life. And then it was introduced to heroin and that was it. That was me back in the system again, being in prison. In and out, in and out, in and out, in and out. And by the time, I've even od twice, I've od twice, I've had the injection through my heart and everything. But that still didn't stop you, you know? Mm. But when I was 42, I thought, right, that's it, this is my last sentence and I'm not going back. And I'm always promising my mum I swear at this time, or my son I swear at this time. But I, I just couldn't, uh, I couldn't date on the end. So when I was 42, I ended up uh, going to the drug club and said, no, when I got out, and they put us like on 80 mil. They put us up from 60 to 80, and uh, it was only meant to be for two years. But then in between that, like, it was like, I may have really going to ever get half a methadone. And so that was when, it for ages, I didn't really care. But then it started to get to us, like, I'm ever going to get half a methadone. And uh, I went to the drug problem centre, and my, work, my worker, my normal worker was a guy. But this woman came out, and she was saying, let's do this together. Because this is, does anybody ever get half a meth? And she says, yeah, let's do this together. And I'm like, what's she on about? But even eight months before that, my sister had died a cancer. But that that as well got me thinking, like, what's what's my life? Am I a failure? What what where am I going to be? And so that that's what got me thinking. And then uh, so the woman for the drug problem said, when I went him, I just I didn't care what it was, but that night I started to say the Lord's prayer. I'd learned it when. Uh, like at assemblies and that at school. And I didn't even care if I was saying it or right, pro probably not, I don't know, I must have been. But and then, so I, I, three nights in a row, I think I was saying it for, but there was a third day that was really the thing. I came back from the chemist and was switching on the telly, like Jeremy Kyle and things like that. Yeah, well, like well, most well. haunted and that. So, what I was, what was, but that's just what I was into stuff like break, that. Break you know? you, man. Exactly, break you. God's been good. Yeah, delivered me. Uh, so, when I put on the telly, like I kept going on to this channel, and it was a Christian channel, and uh, the woman was speaking with Jesus, but she was uh, Joyce Meyer and Pastor Joseph Prince. But I didn't, and I know where that are now, I never at the time. But it was later on at night, this guy, like in an audience, uh, I'm not even sure what the program was, but maybe like I said, broth or a praise thing. So uh, you say, this is for people at home, Jesus could heal you. Uh, where you're at, so could you lift your hands? And so I lifted my hands in the wrist. And when I lifted my hands, 
and and I, I remember like feeling like like a warmth, no like a heat, but and like a tingly heat. There wasn't any fire or nothing like that. But that night, I still went to sleep as normal, and then but when I woke up the next day, it was about eleven o'clock. I was like, oh, yeah, I didn't even remember though. And I was in, in my house and I'm wandering about and I was still getting a shower that was after me. But there was something changed and I didn't know what it was, but I just felt like there was something lifted. But I couldn't explain what it was because I had depression and things like that day. But I didn't feel like that anywhere. So the next day went in, I still never needed it. The next day went in, I still never needed it. The fourth day came and I started to freak out a bit. I was like, oh, what have I done? And what they cut me off? What we have to stop tapping my method on. So I was in the house and like if you had a camera in that house, obviously, it was like wild, like saying, I do believe that you have done this God, what are they? And like going about mental. So I had to say the better tell somebody. So I went about to go to the chemist that day and I got on the bus. The same bus that always got on. And uh, at the side was there was a leaflet, I probably should have brought it up, that's some kind of leaflet. Uh, but it was uh, you said a prayer on it. And uh, so that at that time I knew it was God. I just knew it what you call it, a revelation, but obviously I knew there that I was a sinner. Because before I never thought I was a sinner. I really didn't think I was a sinner. And uh, so I went to the chemist and said to the guy, Do you believe in God? He said, You want to come off my meth? I've met other guy through that. I went back in to see him by the way. And uh, he was like, uh, He was Irish. He's like, Oh, Sharon, I think you better see your, see, see your worker. I was like, uh, Do you not believe me, Alan? <laughs> it's like, ah, I'm a child, and he says, but maybe you should phone your work, and I was like, ah, what do I tell, what do I do, what do I tell this time? And I remember a pal was telling her, I'm going to go to the papers, and I was yeah. saying, uh, Jesus is here, me. honestly, see, you see me at that time, I'm saying that, I'm probably me a man now, but Jesus, <laughs> and so, so, like, uh, I, I, I can be on and say, it was like an arbor, can I act to me an arbor, like, by the neighbour goes, she's on the, <laughs> <laughs> so, so anyway, I phoned her up and, and uh, I said to her, uh, I said, I'm about to come off my methadone. She says, who told you to do that? I said, believe in God. She says, come in and see me. So when I went in to see her, she turned out to be a Christian. And uh, she took me to church through that and obviously I was telling her about the sinner's prayer. But no, what always stands out to me, and I believe God's been speaking to me lately again, is at the bottom it had winners. Winners church it had. Right, but see when I've tried to look for that church in Dundee, I couldn't find it with the address it was on it. But anyway, so she took me to church and in between that time she felt that maybe I should cut down to get a rapid detox, which I did. There was even in the DPC saying to the guys, Yeah, do you believe do you believe in God? Uh, well I do you read the Bible or not? And I was like, John. <laughs> uh, so in between that then so I got baptized in there in uh, the full gospel in Dundee. And then in between that, she took me to a couple of testimonies, a tea challenge testimonies. And mm. uh, so that was 18 mile I came down off it, like in four months. And then I went into tea challenge up north east of Scotland at Benaya. Uh, but way there, God healed me, He restored me, He gave me the plan and the purpose for my life. It wasn't until I went in there that I realized that this is the first thing I've And way there, I moved on, I went to a leadership academy, like it's like a wee Bible college, uh, for a year. And then after that, I worked in a rehab myself as well called Hope House. That's just the same as what I had done. Uh, I was there for about 14 months as an intern support worker. Then I knew God was calling us to get an education and I had a place in Harrogate. Uh, so I went there and I got an education. I was there again for about 14 months. But I'm just going to say this as well. This is to give God the glory to say what God could do in somebody's life. Because I left school at 15 with no education, no nothing. Like, honestly, like, I was just a thief. I was just a junkie. I was everything. But that is the way God said it was. And so in there, I came about with an SVQ2 in health and social care, a quality and diversity level two, mental health awareness level two, health and nutrition level two, and then... I've just finished uh, an institute of counselling and they say it's like uh, an eight, an SQ8. Whether it is, I don't know, but it was hard. Uh, safeguard them, developing assertiveness, people skills, employability skills. And uh, I'm going to want to do a theology. I started mm. on Wednesday. Mm. And, and I know that God is the finish. Come on, yeah. You know? And uh, 
fee there, we had to get I came up to Scotland. I knew God was calling us back to Scotland, but I never knew it was a process. And then uh, Street Connect came up. People used to say to me, do I see you getting outreach go and I see this, and people would say things to me. Obviously, I kind of say, I had my testimony, but what people have said. So I'm, I'm here in Scotland now. I've got my own house. It's all done nicely. God's been really good to me. Fair came up to Scotland. Uh, Street Connect, I'm an outreach support worker, I'm a projects worker now, sorry. And uh, plus as well, obviously, I'm here at Victory Outreach doing my testimony. But that's just to say that God could do this in anybody's life. And a scripture that I always had on to is, For I am God's master, who has created anew in Christ Jesus for good works that he planned for me long ago. Mm. And so it doesn't matter what anybody says about me. You know what I mean? I am God's master, because it's why he says I am. Mm. And like even the times about check to come off when it says you go one way or another, that scripture as well about uh, the things I do, I do not want to do, and the things I want to do, I cannot do. But it's not I who lives, it's a sin who lives within me. And I realise that now that it was only Jesus that was able to save me from the sin. And I'm not saying like I'm made perfect now, but I'm getting sanctified on a daily basis. And, and I, I live for the Lord now, and that's how... I love to worship God. I love to give Him glory and honor yeah. for what He's done because maybe you could see how far He has brought me. Yes, come on. Even though I wasn't, I wasn't, I wasn't in the gutter, I, I wasn't a begging on the street, but it doesn't matter. He saved my soul. I'm going to eternity with Jesus. Mm. And that is how I think I've started to realize about how I would start to long for what's going to happen to me. What am I going to wear past? Mm. You know, because God plants eternity in the heart, mm. and that's what makes you long. Like for these things, you start to search everywhere else, but only God could fill that hole. Only He could make you satisfy you. Thank you. Sharon's an absolute trooper. She really is. And uh, she starts a uh, Bible. Uh, what is it? WTC. She's WT, WTC. Uh, was a. Diploma in a diploma? No, it's a theology. Theology course. Uh, theology course. Theology. Just in the uh, just in the foundation of us now. Right, cool. So she starts uh, this coming Wednesday, right? So we want to just pray for her, right? So let's let's just stretch our hands and let's pray God's blessing upon Sean for this new season of study. Lord, we thank you in Jesus' name for this new season of study, Lord, and we bring Sean before you, Lord, and we pray, Lord, that you would Lord uh, open up our heart, God, open up our our spiritual ears, Lord, my God. May she be like a, a spiritual sponge, Lord, that she would soak everything in, Lord. Lord, her passion for you is evident, Lord. Her, her love for you, God, is so, so, is so uh, uh, radical, Lord. And we just pray that through this next season of study and learning, Lord, grounding her in foundational truths, my God, of theology, Lord. And, I pray, Lord, that where she is, uh, or where she even uh, lacks, or where she is uh, uh, struggles in certain areas, my God, the Holy Spirit, that you would come and, and move and just uh, uh, be the wind beneath her, Lord, be the wind behind her, Lord. Father, financially, we pray that you would bless her also, my God, that you would just continue to shower her and make a way. And bless her in this new season, we pray. What a testimony she is to you, God. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, put your hands together for Sean. Yeah, yeah, and she goes back into the prison. And so she went back into the prison here on Thursday night to speak to the prisoners. But we've got a testimony. Obviously. But we've got a testimony of that another time. Come on, put your hands together for Sean one more time. Come on. Welcome to the house of God this afternoon. This is Victor Outreach, Glasgow. And I want to just encourage you and share with you this afternoon that Victory with Glasgow is not just the name. It, it, it embodies what it is that we believe in. We believe in the victory comes through Jesus Christ our Lord according to the scriptures and according to our experience. But also we believe in reaching out. We believe in reaching out to those that don't, still don't know Jesus. But we do that in many, many different ways. For those of you who don't know, Victory Outreach is a global vision. It is a global vision that's a movement that's over in over 30 countries all over the world. And this isn't just the vision of one man. This was a God-given vision that was given to our founder back in 1966, 1967 when they first started the church. But it was a ministry and a vision that was birthed in the heart of God 
through a desperate cry. Pastor Sonny came through Teen Challenge program as an ex-heroin addict saved through the lineage of David Wilkinson and Nicky Cruz. And then came through that and then started Victory Outreach. Back then it was Victory Temple in 1967. And then Pastor Sonny believed that the people that he was, the people that God was bringing to the church, that he was starting to believe in them, and starting to preach to them, and starting to share to them that God's got a plan for your life, that one's a junkie, not always a junkie, one's a loser, not always a loser, one's broke, not always broke, one's lost, not always lost, that God can use the foolish things of the world, right? That's what the scriptures say, that God can use the foolish things of the world to confound the wise. And this ministry continued to grow and to flourish and God has allowed you and I, he's allowed us to be part of this global vision right here in Glasgow. That God, I wanted to share with you this afternoon that we have been given the mandate to preach the gospel of Jesus Christ and also to carry the flag of victory outreach and to plant it in this city and in this nation for the glory and the honour of the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, just as I was just Looking over and praying over this message yesterday, I've been around the Lord and I've been saved over 20 years. And what I've saw over the years is uh, I've saw that internationally and globally in any ministry, worldwide, in any, you know, uh, global ministry or ministry that's in multiple cities, there's always three groups of people within each church. The first group is this, the first group are those who are generally associated they like to just come and just drop in every now and again and watch from afar. But there's kind of low level connection and low level, in fact there's zero commitment. But there's low level connection. The second group of people is that there's a generally connected group. And these are the ones that are more connected to the church, may even be in church week in and week out. But they're not still connected to the vision. They don't see themselves as the vision being theirs. They come and they get blessed and they come and receive and they come and connect but the vision of the church and the vision of the ministry hasn't quite been received into their heart that they see themselves not only as part of the church but they see themselves as part of the vision and then you get a third group of people in every church and every ministry globally worldwide and this is usually the smallest group of people and they're the pillars they're the pillars in the ministry these are the people that are behind the vision, that are behind the pastors, that are behind the church. They're committed not only, they don't just come to church to receive, but they come to church and they're committed to the vision, to make the vision stand, to make the vision thrive, and to make the vision, the vision work. And my assignment today by God is to come and is to share with us and encourage us to move on potentially from just being a general uh, receiver to become a participant in the vision. The vision that God has given to Victory Outreach International is to be a church in every city across the world that go and make disciples of all nations. Go and believe in people. Go into the darkest corners. Go into the darkest areas. Go into the places that no one else is going to. Reach the people no one else is talking to. Go to those who are hurt. Go to those who are lost preach the gospel to them it's a great vision it's a vision that comes straight from the gospel Matthew 28 it's a gospel given vision that we have within this ministry it's a great global vision but it's also a local vision here in Glasgow and over the next coming season we're going to be looking at that we're going to be looking at the church the church of Jesus Christ but we're also going to be looking at what does that church mean for us what's our part to play within this global vision which is called the church. And over the next season we're going to be looking at, into the theme of uh, uh, the, the theme of the next few weeks is called Heart of the House. This afternoon I want to share a word with you that I pray will make you or encourage you to lean into the heart of God. To lean into the heart of God. How many of us in this place today can say, God, I want to be closer to you. God, I want to know your heart more. I want to, I want to surrender fully to you, God. I want to surrender fully to you so that you can use my life to make a difference in this generation. Turn in your Bibles then to the book of Acts chapter 15. The book of Acts chapter 15. The Bible says this, you can read it on the screen behind me. It says this, afterwards I will return and restore 
the fallen house of David, and I will rebuild its ruins and restore it, so that the rest of humanity may seek the Lord, including the Gentiles, and all those I have called to be mine, the Lord has spoken. He who made these things known so long ago. And so my judgment is this. This is James, the half-brother of Jesus, speaking here. He said, and so my judgment is this, that we should not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are turning to God. Let's pray. Lord, we come to you one more time in humility. We come to you this afternoon and acknowledge you as our Lord and Saviour. We come to you this afternoon, we acknowledge our need for you, we acknowledge our dependence for you, we acknowledge, Lord, that with you we can do all things, we acknowledge that without you we are weak. We acknowledge this afternoon that we are hopeless without you. But we also acknowledge this afternoon that with you we are full of hope, we are full of life. And this afternoon, God, we acknowledge today that your word is absolute. Lord, that there is no contradiction in it 100%. That, Lord, that your word is life, that your word is the answer for every problem in humanity. We thank you for your Holy Spirit in this place today. We ask that you would move in this place in Jesus' name. Amen. Recently, I was reminded of an old car restoration program I used to watch. And you watch like you watch like house restoration or car restoration or bike restoration or whatever. But recently I was reminded of an old program program I used to watch. They used to restore old cars. Take these beaten up ones, these ones that have been that were once loved and left. And part of the program was uh, uh, that they would take these old models and they would begin to start working on them. And what happened the other day is I was speaking to someone and we were talking about a set of keys. We're talking about a set of keys for a car. Now, I've got a set of keys here, and they don't really look like much. It's got one of them little pop-out things. But one, but maybe you know, or maybe you don't know, but inside these keys, there's a wee chip in this key that only allows it to start my car. Like, this this, this uh, uh, key is programmed to start my car. Don't look like much. Don't look like there's a program in there, but there is. But we were talking the other day, because I remember back in the day, my, all you had was a key. There was no fob, there was no program inside of it. It was just a key, you stuck it in, and you turned it and opened the door. Pretty much just a wee bit like this. You had a key that just plugged into your car, you turned it, it was, you know, no thrills attached. And you know, the, 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 the part of the program that I used to love was, and part of the reason why these people used to re-work uh, and rebuild these cars is they loved the simplicity of these cars. You know, today's modern cars, man, they're so they're so full of gadgets and lights. There's gadgets for your tires, there's gadgets that tell you your, your seat's getting too hot, your gadgets for your mirrors to put out, you know, there's gadgets for your air con, right? There's gadgets for all these different things like like if, if your tire goes down like one PSI, your your whole board starts flashing up and telling you and you're panicking oh, what's wrong with my car? You never had anything like that back in the day. It was just simple. Your tire was flat and it wasn't your tire was down or it wasn't. Your key worked or it didn't. <clears throat> uh, I hope m most of you in this place will remember the old-fashioned uh, window things. You had to actually wind your window doing like that. See, I feel sorry for this generation that they'll never have to experience winding a window down. I'll tell you, get empty. Right? You know what I mean? I, never, I, I feel sorry for this generation that they'll never have to experience stuff like that. But the, 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 what the, the heart of the conversation I was having is that, is that things can get so complicated. Things that get complicated, and the reason why I love old cars is because they're simple. They're not flash, they're not all technologically advanced, but they're, they're sturdy, they're solid. You know what I mean? They, they, uh, they, they're, they're, they're not flashy or they're not shiny, but they're solid and they're reliable. There's something about the simplicity of the cars that were built back in the day. You see, the original purpose of a car or a vehicle was to move people from one place to another, to change your destination and to take people places they had never been before. We take nowadays technology, take all the technology within the cars, computer systems and programs, and even when it comes to repairing your car these days, you have to hook it up to a computer. And the computer will take you and tell you everything about your car. But the problem, problem with 
technology is is that uh, is that uh, is that we can um, we can get co too caught up in, in all of the technology and all of the computer programs and all of these things. But the things that stand out about these old cars is is that the simplicity is is that they were built to move people from one place to another. I'm a new person but I like old cars. I'm in this new season of technology but, 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 I, but there's some things from the past that I just prefer. And in this text that we just read here we find ourselves in the New Testament the New Dispensation, the New Grace we find ourselves in the Book of Acts we find ourselves the Spirit of God being poured out in the day of Pentecost and all these believers and the church has been launched and outreach has taken place and people are getting saved. Then in the 15th chapter, James, the half-brother of John, stands up and speaks of an Old Testament prophecy that was originally from Amos chapter 9. You can go back there in your own time, but Amos chapter 9 is a heavy, heavy chapter in which God is dealing with Israel. He's dealing with Israel and he's giving it to them. You know, he's chopping them, like, you know, you're, you're rebellious, you, you always turn away from me. But in chapter 9, when it gets to, like, verse number 11, where this scripture comes from, there's, like, a change in God's heart. There's a change and, like, a transition where God goes from chopping them and then God starts to remind them, but I'm still the God of restoration. I'm still the God who loves you. No matter what you've done, no matter where you've been, no matter who you've fiddled with, no matter, you know, no matter who you've connected with, no matter what it is that you've done, he reminds them that I'm still the God who loves you, that I'm still the God who will restore you, that I'm still the God that desires a relationship with you, regardless of every time you've wandered, and regardless of every time you've made mistakes, and regardless of every time you've disrespected me or not spoke to me, I'm still the God who wants to bring restoration to the house of Israel. You have a New Testament writer here in the book of Acts prophesying and speaking about an Old Testament prophecy given by God. There's this New Testament reference back to the Old Testament about how God will, after it says here in, in verse 15, uh, James stands up and he's, I'll read a little bit further to give you context, but he said this, he says, when they had finished, James stood up and said, brothers, listen to me. Peter has told you about the time God first visited the Gentiles to take them, uh, to take them from a people from himself. And this conversation, sorry, this conversion of Gentiles, exactly what the prophet predicted and it is written afterwards, I will return and restore the fallen house of David, and I will rebuild its ruins and restore it. Now the context of chapter 15 is important. The context of chapter 15 of the book of Acts is found in a discussion about how Gentiles get saved. There was a group of people, if you read the beginning of chapter 15, there was a group of people that came and they started to say that Gentiles could only become saved if they first became Jews and got circumcised, then they could become a Christian. In other words, what they were doing was they were placing loops and hoops in front of people, saying you can't just go from being a Gentile to being a Christian. You've got to first go Gentile, then Jew, get circumcised, then follow Jesus. And so this was the context of what was happening here. And the elders of the church came together and had some discussions, and they replied to the message. And they replied to the message that came from those who held the view of circumcision first. And they came to this view in verse number uh, 11 of chapter 15. It says, we believe, this was their response, that we believe that we are all saved the same way by the undeserved grace of the Lord Jesus Christ. James stands up and shares what was happening with the salvation of the Gentiles that was prophesied about, that God loves the Gentiles. He loves those that are far from him. He loves them. He says, afterwards, I will return and restore the fallen house of David. And after, this afternoon, I want to share with you three things that we can learn from this verse. And you might think that this is a strange verse that I'm talking about having a, a God's favorite house. But I hope you're going to see through what I share in a minute is that out of all the tabernacles that God could have restored, i.e. the tabernacle of Moses, the tabernacle of Solomon, out of all of these tabernacles and tents and houses that God could have restored, God desired to restore the house 
of David, the ten of David. And I'm going to show you why. I'm going to, I'm going to show you why this is so important to God's favorite house. This afternoon, I want to share with you the point number one is this, is that God desires intimacy more than intellectual knowledge. God desires an intimate relationship with you and I rather than just us knowing about God, do we actually know him? Matthew, 20, Matthew 7, 21 and 23 says this, Not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those, this is very heavy scripture. This is a scripture we have to check ourselves. Only those who do the will of my Father will enter. I can pause right there and I can preach a whole sermon on that message right there. Because there's a, there's, a, there's a difference from being saved to doing the will of the Father. Right? Anyway, we'll leave that for another time. So on judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, we've prophesied in your name, cast out demons in your name, and performed many miracles in your name. But I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who breaks God's law. It's an interesting part of what James declares in Amos 9 is that the house that God, the house that God chose to restore was different from the other houses or the different the other tabernacles. You see, the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle, I'm going, to, I'm going to teach a lot about today, the tabernacle of Moses and the tabernacle of Solomon, right? Maybe if, if you could put the second, the second slide up just now, show you a picture of the, the, the tabernacle up here. Not the other one. That one. Other one. The middle one. There. And so if you watch online, uh, uh, this is a picture of the... Uh, the tabernacle here. This is a tabernacle. It's a picture of the tabernacle of Moses. And the tabernacle of Moses had, maybe you've heard it before, maybe you've not heard it before, but it had an outer court, which is where all these people are here on the outside, the tents are. Then you had a middle, uh, so you had an outer court, you had an inner court, and then inside that block over there, behind the veil, and through there was a place they called the Holy of Holies. And so you got the outer court, you got the inner court, and then you have the Holy of Holies. It's the same with the temple of, or the tabernacle of, of uh, Solomon. It was the exact same thing. It was an exact same kind of replica of that. Except the tabernacle of Solomon, as you expect, because Solomon had all the money and all that. The tabernacle of Solomon was, was magnificent. It was, it was, you know, all the money was spent there. All the pomp was spent there. It looked good on the outside. However, God didn't choose what looked good on the outside. Which shows us that God really is the interesting and how something looks. He's interested in what's at the heart of that thing. We know that because we know that when God chose David, the way we say is that God chose David. Why? Because he was a man after God's own heart. And there was nothing to do with what looked like on the natural, but it was all to do with what was inside. You see, God desires intimacy so much that God's desire was to rebuild the tabernacle of David. Mm -hmm. um, Solomon built a magnificent building that housed the ark of God. But God didn't choose to rebuild his tabernacle. David built a house from God, not from instructions like Moses and Solomon. But God, David built a house for God out of devotion. You can turn in your Bibles to the book of 2 Samuel chapter 7. I'm just going to read it. It should be on the screen behind you right now. Book of 2 Samuel chapter 7. Hear, hear the heart of God. Hear the heart of David here. Chapter 7 verse 1. When King David was settled in his palace and the Lord had given him rest from the surrounding enemies. Watch this. David was in his palace. David had peace. His enemies were at peace with him. The king summoned Nathan the prophet. Look, David says, I'm living here in a beautiful cedar place, but the ark of God is out there in a tent. Try and hear the heart of David in this. And the heart of David is in this, and David saying, listen, God, you've blessed me. God, you've given me a palace. I came from the sheep field. 
I came from the stench of sheep and dirt and mud and fighting bears and lions and pits. I came from a life of obscurity, but now I'm living in a palace. I came from living a life where I had no roof over my head to now living in a place where I've got everything. And he says, God, not only that, he says, but my enemies are even at peace with me. In other words, God had started to work in his business and he brought peace in his life, victory over his enemies. And it was because of that gratefulness, David then says, Lord, I find myself living in a palace, God, I want to build a house for you. His heart was to build a house for God's presence to dwell in. You see, God's presence back in the day was a thing called the Ark of the Covenant. If you could put that slide up, that would be amazing. First one. The Ark of the Covenant, which you see behind me here, was this gold box with two cherubim on top. And in the middle of the cherubim was where this blue light of God's presence was. And inside the Holy of Holies, the Ark of the Covenant was placed. But the Ark of the Covenant was placed so far away from the reach of normal people. David desired to build a house for God. And I just, there's something about David's life that just, I love. That David knew where he came from. David recognized that God had been good to him. That once he lived a life that he had no roof over his head, now he finds himself in a palace. You see, God, David knew that God had been faithful to him. <clears throat> David knew <clears throat> that God had never let him down. David knew that God helped him overcome Goliath. David knew that he, had, that he had been in a place of obscurity. David knew that God had blessed him. David knew that God was his all-sufficient place of power and authority. And because of that, David's heart was to bless God. David's heart was like this, God, you've been good to me. You've been faithful. You brought down Goliath. You gave me a roof. You gave me a house. You gave me this. You gave me all that I've got, God. You gave me everything that I have, God. And now because of everything I have, God, I want to build for you a house. I want to build a place for your presence to dwell. I want to get busy, God. You give me everything. I want to do something where I can bless you. I want to build a house for you to dwell does anybody know in this place today that God's been good to them? Amen. That maybe you lived a lifestyle where you had no roof over your head Amen. for a season. You lived rough. You lived in the streets. You lived in people's couches or your lifestyle was, was ravaged. Your lifestyle was mad. You didn't have your own place. You didn't have your own car. You didn't even have your own couch. You didn't have your own fridge. Or maybe you did do, but maybe you were in madness and had no peace. But the Bible says that David recognized that God had given him everything, that God had opened up doors for him, that everything he had was from God. And because God was so good to him, David's desire was to build a house Amen. for God. Amen. And you know, sometimes in the Christian circles, you know, we say, oh, we need an encounter with God. You know, one encounter changes everything and it does. Mm -hmm. But do you know who desires an encounter more than us? God desires man encounters, women encounters, more than we desire God encounters. Now we know that from the scriptures that on that day when Jesus hung on the cross, the Bible says that the, the, the veil, I'm getting a bit ahead of myself, uh, so I'm going to kind of slow down a little bit. But anybody in this place know that God's been good to them? Anybody in this place know today that we want to spend the rest of our lives building something for God? So God wants an intimate relationship with us. That's the first thing we have to remember as to why God desired to rebuild the house of David. Here's why. Because the house of David was different from the house of Solomon and Moses. Why, I hear you ask. Because the tent of David or the tabernacle of David or the house of David had no walls. It was a church without Walls. Pick up the tower, the, the middle one, the second one. Here. This was Solomon's temple, a uh, tabernacle, and Moses' tabernacle, right? See, surrounded by walls and gates and fences and pillars and posts. And to look at that, you think, man, I'm not quite sure if I want to go in there. 
Looks a bit scary to go in. What if I don't get accepted when I go in? What, 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 what happens to say there? All I see is offerings and sacrifices and people laying stuff down and, you know, people... David's tabernacle, if you go to the next one, David's tent had no walls. It was just a tent with the presence of God in Why did God want to build David's tabernacle? Was because it was, a, it was where God's presence was, but there were no walls. Have you ever heard the term, the church without walls? Have you ever heard that? What does that mean? That means that we don't just keep what's going on in here, but we take what happens in here in the presence of God. We take what happens from our encounter, but we don't keep it within the four walls. We take it into the highways and the byways to the Gentiles, to the drug addicts, to the lost, to the depressed, to the suicidal. Listen, one of the reasons why God wanted to rebuild David's temple or David's tabernacle was that there was no boundaries and there was no restrictions to people coming to the presence of God. Tabernacles of Moses and Solomon were constructed the same. They had outer court, inner court, holy of holies. The presence of God was protected by layers. And I don't know about you, man, but I'm done with layers. I'm done with layers. What do I mean? What do, Pastor, what do you mean by I'm done with layers? Like, I'm done with people putting man-made things in front of people coming to God. Man-made constructions, man-made doctrine, man-made theology, man-made obstacles. Why did God want to build David's temple? Because there was direct access to the presence of God. There was no walls. You see, the reason why uh, they, all these restrictions and stuff, I think God wanted to do away with this, is because all these walls kept people away. It kept people out. What was on inside there? <laughs> uh, is this this big blue flame comes up to the sky every now and again and all I hear about is animals screaming and people shakalaka lacking and all that stuff going on inside. But I never see anything. I, I know, but all this stuff is putting me off. You see, inside the Holy of Holies was the Ark of God, which carried the presence of God. And inside the Ark, there was the two tablets of Moses. There was manna from the wilderness. And there was Adam's rod that budded, even though it was disconnected from the root of the tree. Yeah. You see, as long as we place man-made walls in the church, we are restricting people from coming into the presence of God and into the miracle territory of God and experiencing the presence of God, the power of God, the provision of God, and the miracle-working power of God. Why did God want to restore David's house? Because it had no walls. Yes. You see, as long as the walls are up, as long as God's presence is protected behind these walls. I remember I went to a church one time and somebody off the street walked in and everybody turned around with a look of disgust. As if to say, a sinner's walked in. <laughs> and I thought to myself, is that what it's supposed to be? But some places, man, they can get so protective of what's inside. That they forget that, listen, what's inside is supposed to go outside. Mm -hmm. And we're supposed to be people who remove barriers and remove limitations to the presence of God. Why? So that more people can come to experience the freedom that Sharon has got, the freedom that we've got in this place today. Mm -hmm. David's house had no walls. Mm -hmm. It was just a house that protected the Ark of the Covenant from the sun. God's favourite house is one where there's no barriers between inside and outside. And what we have available in here, we need to make sure that the outside are also getting what we're getting inside. God's favourite house is an open house. A house that's passionate about his presence. And a house that wants everywhere else and everyone else to experience it too. You see, I come to church on a Sunday and I get blessed. I'm the pastor of the church, but I leave blessed. 
I'll leave encouraged. I'll leave filled. I've been celebrating what God's done in my life all week. And after I leave here, the purpose of me leaving here is for me to leave armed, for me to leave encouraged, so that Monday morning when I come against somebody, Monday morning when I see someone, Monday afternoon when I see someone, I give them what Jesus has given me. Amen. And that's what we desire here at Victory Outreach. We desire and we believe that after all God has done in our lives, that we gather here today on days like today to celebrate, to connect and receive and then we go out and we share with others. Somebody say no walls. No walls. Number three, and I'm finishing up here. Number one, God desires an intimate relationship with us. That's why he desired to rebuild the tabernacle of David. Why? Because it had no walls which meant we could come into the presence of God. Number three is this. Is this is that is that God made a way? God tore the veil. See, one of the main differences between the, the, the tabernacle of Solomon and the tabernacle of David is if you could put the, 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 the tent up just one more time, that one here, is this there's no veil in front of that. There's no veil. This is one of the main differences between the, the tabernacle of David and the tabernacle of Solomon is, is that there's no veil. What was the veil for? The veil was because men and God couldn't connect because of man's sin. Because of the sinfulness of man, we had to send the high priest in once a year to make atonement for our sins. And even then the high priest went in and he had to have wee bells tied to his legs and all that in case he encountered the presence of God and then he would die and then they'd have to pull him out. But what we see here is we see David's tent had no veil. In other words, God made a way for direct, direct access to the presence of God. No longer was the veil in place. We had acted that there was 24-7 access to the presence of God. Can anyone remember if, you're, if you're, you can remember that far back to when you were 18? When you were 18, you get the key to the door. Yeah. <laughs> when you turn 18, I don't know about you, but it's kind of like a thing. You turn 18, you get the key to the door. Which means that you've went from you've went from only your parents letting you in, right? To now having access to this door 24-7. And how many of us we rinsed that door? Come on, how many of us we you know as soon as we could not we rinsed that door? We were coming in at 2 or 3 in the morning, or uh, maybe a couple of days later. But when God was saying, and I'm coming to a close because I know it's been a bit of a longer service today, what God is saying is that God wants to rebuild the house of David. It's because this, please hear me, it's because God doesn't want anything to separate the lost from being saved. Amen. And that's what James, the half-brother of John, was saying about these, these conversations about, oh, you have to be a Gentile, has to get circumcised first, and you have to jump through all these hoops, and you have to do all that kind of thing so you can become a Christian. When, when, when John said that, what he was saying was, he was speaking of God's restoration, God's love for humanity, God's love for the fallen, and, and, and the prophecy was that, 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 that God wants to rebuild a house, and he doesn't want anything to separate the lost from being saved. Luke's Gospel, chapter 23, verse 44. By this time it was about noon, the darkness fell across the whole land until three o'clock. The light from the sun was gone and suddenly the curtain in the sanctuary of the temple was torn down the middle. And Jesus shouted, Father, I entrust my spirit into your hands. And with those words, he breathed his last breath. You see, through Jesus upon the cross, the veil of separation between humanity and divinity was broken, was ripped was torn, watch this, from top to bottom. That God loved broken people so much that he sent his son Jesus Christ to die upon a cross for you and I. That God loved the world so much that he literally ripped the veil between separation between divinity and humanity. He loved the broken world so much that he literally made a way for access for people to come into the presence of God. You see, God doesn't want the church to start putting limitations and boundaries and barriers in front of the lost. 
And sometimes we can be, we go, oh, you have to do this, you have to be clean, you have to stop smoking, you have to stop drinking. Oh, you have to, you know, you have to get a shower, but you have to brush your teeth before you come. <laughs> For some people, hey, amen, keep brushing your teeth, but you know what I'm saying? But when you think of the story of the prodigal son who was out there eating with the pigs, mm -hmm. the Bible says nowhere mm -hmm. did he get a shower before he came back to his father. Yeah. He came dirty. Yeah. He came stinking. He came filthy. <laughs> we know the scripture here that the temple, the veil was torn. Access was granted to the Jew and the Gentile. And to anyone who would call upon the name of the Lord, they would be saved. You see, rebuilding the house of David, watch this, it's not about a, it's not about a, a mechanical reproduction. It's not about actually physically building it. But it's about rebirthing and restoring the passion of David. Amen. To build something for God. To build something for God that had no limitations, no access, problems, no boundaries. David desired to build a house for God and so rebuilding the house of David it's not about mechanically reproducing it but it's about rebirthing and restoring the passion that caused him to build it in the first place. Do you still have passion? Do you still have passion for his presence? Do you still have passion to be in his presence? Do you still have passion for the lost? Do you still have passion to serve? Do you still have passion to lay down your life? Do you still have passion to go evangelizing even though the flesh is screaming? Do you still have passion to worship and come to church even though everyone else is saying go here? So rebuilding that house of David isn't about mechanically reproducing it. But it's about rebirthing and restoring the passion mm -hmm. that caused it to be built in the first place. David wanted everyone to experience God's presence, and so do I. Mm -hmm. I want everybody to experience God's presence too, and I believe that you do too. And that's why God has you given victories today, because we are a church that believe in passion and intimate worship with Jesus. Mm -hmm. We believe, man, for all God has done for our life. Some say you should dance like David. Well, potentially I'm not going to do that in this house. But I might dance like, I might dance. But I'm not going to dance like David. Because, you know, David literally danced in his birthday suit. I ain't all about doing dancing in my, oh, in, my, in, in my birthday suit, man. Amen. Before the Lord. You know, sometimes just because it says it in the Bible doesn't mean to say that's to be reproduced. Yeah. Hallelujah. <laughs> Amen. But the passion of doing that, of celebrating the presence of God. You see, a church with the walls. We take what we've got here and we take it there. A church without veils as we remove obstacles and restrictions and we see other people come and encounter God. And the purpose of the church is not just to become a social clubhouse. Not just a kumbaya place. This isn't just a, you know, this isn't just a Weight Watchers thing. We come every week and, you know, dance around the sanctuary and hope we've lost a few pounds. <laughs> This is where we come and get blessed by God. We celebrate, we worship, we thank God for everything we've done. Then with a heart like David, we say, God, you've been so good to me, God. I just want to do something for you. I just want to build something for you. I want to go tell more people about you. I want to go do something that honors your name. I want to dance with a new dance, sing with a new sing, pray with a new power. I want to prophesy with a new sword in my mouth. I want to clap with a new clap, dance with a new clap, jump with a new jump. God, I want to restore the passion of David for your presence again. Lord, that there would be a church that would be passionate about yeah. the presence of God, 24-7 access yeah. to the throne of God. Oh God, that you would wake me up at 3 o'clock in the morning, Lord, with a burden for the lost, that I would wake up and hit my knees, that my first thought wouldn't be, oh, we're working five hours, but my first thought would be, oh God, if you call me to wake up, if you call me to the presence, if you call me to prayer, then Lord, I'm there. See, I believe that this is God's favorite house. Yes. A house of passionate worship. Amen. A house without any walls. And a house without any veils. Mm. 
Today, I want to just come into a close right now. I want to just throw this out here. Every house is not perfect. Every home is not perfect. If you look far enough, you'll find faults and failures. If you dig deep enough, you'll, sure enough, you'll find some character flaws in most of us. But God's been good to us. And he's gathered us together around a vision, around a plan, around a mission. To go reach lost people for his glory and his honor. Today I want to challenge you, if you're watching online or you're here in person, that today is the day to take a step closer to the vision. Take a step closer to the vision. Today is the day to, not to, to stop being a watcher and become a participant. You know, it goes back to the Solomon's temple and Moses' temple. The Bible says that they had three parts. Our court and our court, holy of holies. And I've used that and spoke about that a few times to just speak to people and encourage us to take that next step from being someone who just looks in over the top to being someone who takes a step in and says, you know what, I want to be part of this mission. I want to be part of reaching souls. People's moving already. I want to be part of reaching souls. I want to be part of a church with the walls. I want to be part of a church that is intimate in their worship and don't care what people say. I've been in churches, man, and the worship has been dynamic. And people are standing there. Oh, I left them my hands. He's a Christian in jacket. I, ain't got it. I know God's telling me to get my knees, but my knees jeans, I've just bought them. I know it's a dusty old floor, but God's telling me to glide cross, lie, 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 lie flat on my face. But what will people think of me? The chaos. What did David do when he brought the presence of God, the presence of God back? He rejoiced. Even his own misses spoke yeah. negative against God. You know what the Bible says about her? Mm -hmm. She spoke negative about the presence of God. You know what the Bible says? She was barren for the rest of her life. Can I just share with you? Yeah. That intimate worship produces something in life. Amen. It produces fruit. Mm -hmm. I want you to share this. You guys know this already, but I want to share this. Zoe and I, my wife and I, who stood the Bible. We want to see people saved. Yeah. We want to see families restored. I wrote these down because I don't want to, I wrote these down this long. We want to see all of you, most of you, all of you, <laughs> married with children. We want to see God bless you. We want to see some of you baptized. We want to see north of Glasgow and the whole of Glasgow and carry our Jesus. We want some of you to be raised up in the leadership and become pastors and leaders and worship leaders and all different types of leaders. We want to see a thriving youth minister in our church. And I know we can look around and say, well, who's going to help who? I want to see a men's recovery home. I want to see these. Men of each other. I want to see these two rows here. Filled with draw extra addicts praising Jesus because he's set them free. Amen. I want to see this wee back section over here. I'm speaking in the spirit right now. I want to see this wee back section over here because you know the youth don't come to the front. They hang around like the sinners roll at the back. <laughs> I want to see that whole back section filled with youth. Mm -hmm. So much that they have to sit at those tables. Mm -hmm. I want to see the family of restored drug addicts come here and give their lives to Jesus. Mm -hmm. Oh, look what's happened to my son. Look what's happened to my daughter. Yeah. Man, I want Jesus in my life. Yeah. I believe that's God's favourite house. And so I'm saying I'm about to say this. Would you join us in prayer? Would you join us in evangelism? Would you join us in reaching the youth? Would you partner with us in this great vision of victory reach? We in the perfect ministry. If you find one, please tell me. <laughs> no. I ain't a perfect pastor, right? I'm sorry, but I'll let you down. Yeah. 
You're living. I'm sorry if I've not let you down. I'm sorry if I've not, I've not returned the phone call. I'm sorry if I've not been on fire every week. I'm sorry if I've, if I've done something to you. But I love you guys. And I believe that this is God. I believe, I believe that this is God's God's house, and God wants to use foolish things in the world to do great and many things. And all we have to do, Daniel chapter eleven, for those who know their God, Amen. shall have strength mm-hmm. and shall do mighty exploits. Those who know their God. Mm -hmm. Not those who hear about our God. Not those who read about our God. But those who know their God. See, I don't know who your God is. I hope it's the same one. (laughs) But my God, he's all powerful. My God is a miracle working God. My God is Jesus, the Lord of salvation. The stairway between heaven and earth. The doorway between darkness and eternity. Between life and eternal life. My God saves the sinners. My Jesus hung about with the sinners. My Jesus ate with the sinners. My Jesus, he didn't do as the sinners do, but he sat with them. And I want to encourage us, church, for this next three months in a year, We are going to go on a heart. We are going to love people. Mm. First Corinthians 13, what does it say about love? Love endures. Mm. Love holds no records of wrong. Love hopes. You know, for this next three months, man, I want to give us a challenge. For the next three months, every Sunday, be here. Bring someone. Bring someone. Let's build this house for God. Look at the seat next to you. And say, next week, somebody else is going to be sitting there. You know what? I'm finished with them. You know the house, God's favorite house? It's a house of infinite worship. House without no walls, and a house without no veils. A house that has access to the presence of God 24 7. And I don't know about you, but I'm feeling in my spirit, man. We're going to be launching it some more victory groups. We've got a men's group already. We're going to be launching our second B group, right? We're going to be having some more all night prayers. Uh, we're going to be having some more evangelism outreaches, right? We, we're going to be. We're Speak, I'm telling you, telling you right now, God is going to do great many things. We ask you guys this afternoon to come and be part of what it is that we're doing. If you're part of another church already, absolutely fine. We are not trying to steal you. If you've got a shepherd already, amen, be faithful to him. But if you don't, we've got room for you in our food. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, this afternoon, Yeah.
Who else can break down the top? 